Okay, Brown's acquired syndrome is uh, something that commonly comes up on the USMLE. And so it's definitely worth talking about because it's a very distinct syndrome. So this comes with a wider array of talks on spinal cord lesions. Uh, which includes syringomyelia, subacute combined degeneration, bronze squared syndrome, ASA stroke, cauda equina syndrome, and spinal compression. If you haven't watched my video on, uh, on the neuroanatomy, you should probably do that because this is stuff that's easily forgotten, but it's very, very important for remembering uh, the basics and to help uh, hammer down these lesions and make it easier to remember. So the corticospinal tract is our uh, our main motor tract, and we start out at our motor cortex, remember our homunculus, and that projects upper motor neurons, which are just neurons that travel down the spinal cord. They decussate at the lower medulla, and they continue down to the level at which they are to uh, send off their projections to the muscles. So once they've reached that level, they synapse with another neuron, which is the lower motor neuron. So we have upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. And the lower motor neurons then travel to the muscle. We have decussation here at the lower medulla. The DCML tract is a sensory tract. So in this case, we're starting at the periphery. So sensory neurons, which the DCML is responsible for fine touch and proprioception, come in from the skin or from uh, the, the area uh, where we're sensing the fine touch or proprioception. And those send primary neurons to the spinal cord, which enter through the posterior horn and synapse. They travel through the posterior column, which the posterior column sits right between the uh, posterior horns. And it travels all the way up to uh, the superior medulla where it then decussates. Um, it decussates, uh, and once when it decussates, it then, uh, rather than traveling in a posterior column, it actually travels in this medial lemniscus, which is in a different part of the spinal cord. It's more anterior and it's medial. And that travels up to the thalamus, uh, where it synapses, and then finally that nerve, which is the third nerve in the tract, goes to the somatosensory cortex. So we have three synapses, or two synapses, three nerves. We have a synapse at entrance, and then we have a synapse at the thalamus. The spinothalamic tract is similar to the DCML tract, uh, with a couple exceptions. Uh, first off, the, the spinothalamic tract is responsible for uh, sensing crude touch and pain and temperature. And the spinothalamic tract comes in, primary neurons, first order neurons come in, they enter the dorsal horn, and then they uh, synapse, just like DCML, but then rather than traveling up and decussating, the spinothalamic tract decussates right away. And then the spinothalamic tract, the secondary neuron, travels all the way up to the thalamus and then uh, sends its projections to the somatosensory cortex. So the important thing, and particularly here where we're talking about brown sequard syndrome, is that the spinothalamic tract decussates right away. It doesn't wait for the medulla. So this is just a relation of uh, where these tracts are relative to one another. And this isn't to scale or anything, but I just wanted to sort of relate that the DCML is in this posterior uh, area of the spinal cord in between the dorsal horns and then when it decussates it goes to this more anterior location which is the medial lemniscus. Uh, the spinothalamic tract comes in, decussates right away and travels in this, uh, this anterior lateral uh, area. I tried to make these different colors, these two blues, but it didn't work out too well. <laughs> Um, so this is the uh, spinothalamic tract. So it kind of stays in the same position the whole way up. And then the uh, corticospinal tract travels down uh, these columns and uh, then it, when it decussates, uh, it sends about 90% of its, uh, of its 
fibers across to the other side, uh, which forms the uh, uh, lateral corticospinal tract, and the other 10% that don't decussate form the anterior corticospinal tract. So here's our corticospinal tracts right here. Lateral, which is most of them, and anterior. Okay, so here's our cervical spine, and this is pretty much how all of our spine is. The picture I just copied this from was a cervical spine. So here's our DCML traveling up the posterior, uh, this posterior column here, and then our uh, motor tract, the corticospinal tract, has uh, two tracts, the lateral and then the non-decussating anterior. And then we also have our spinal flying tract. So brown sequard syndrome is a hemisection of the spinal cord. So you can think of it as if you were to cut out half of your spinal cord. So this is going to affect, like in any spinal injury, it's going to affect that level and everything below it. So what happens when we have brown sequard syndrome? What happens when we cut half of our spinal cord? Well, this is where knowing the anatomy is going to be really important. Because if you know the anatomy, knowing what happens when you cut off half the spinal cord will make perfect sense. So if you're cutting off half of your spinal cord, what happens to the DCML? Well, remember the DCML is a sensory tract, so everything below it you're going to lose uh, because this is before the decussation, you're going to lose ipsilateral because it hasn't decussated yet. So everything you're going to lose for fine touch and proprioception is going to be ipsilateral. Same with the corticospinal tract. Even though this is traveling down, everything you lose is going to be ipsilateral because it's uh, already decussated. Now, the, 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 reason why, uh, the reason why with the DCML it's ipsilateral because you haven't decussated yet is because it's traveling upward. And with the corticospinal tract for motor, uh, it's uh, because it's already decussated it's because it's traveling downward. So these nerves from this tract, uh, from the corticospinal tract, are going to travel out to the, this left-hand side here. Patient's left, your right. Uh, with the DCML, though, this is receiving input from patient's left, your right. So this is, they're both going to be ipsilateral. Now, on the other hand, with the spinothalamic tract, it's receiving its information from the other side because it has already decussated. So this is going to result in a contralateral loss because this spinothalamic tract here receives information from the right side. And so uh, because the, the spinothalamic tract has already decussated, it decussates right away, you're going to lose information from the contralateral side. Here's our nerves coming in from patient's right side and going into the left spinothalamic tract. So if you lose your left spinothalamic tract, you're going to lose right-sided sensations of temperature and, uh, and pressure and pain. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So brown sequard syndrome is incomplete hemisection, uh, which is injury of the spinal cord, and the extent of the symptoms are going to depend on the level of the injury. It's always going to include the level of the injury and then everything below it. And it's contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation, which is our uh, spinal thalamic tract, ipsilateral loss of fine touch and vibratory sensation, and ipsilateral loss of motor function. Pure brown sequard syndrome in and of itself is rare. Usually it involves other, uh, other symptoms. Common causes are going to be trauma, which are penetrating trauma, very commonly gunshot wound, uh, knife wound, um, or uh, non-penetrating trauma, which would be, for instance, maybe a car accident. Uh, where uh, bones of the spine were broken. Uh, tumor, which could be primary or metastatic, more common it's metastatic, ischemia or infarction, or MS. And this is a non include I mean, this is, this is not a complete list here. Okay, so patients who have Brown-Stickward syndrome 
usually their history is going to be some kind of spinal injury. So um, the most common way to get brown saquard syndrome, a pure brown saquard syndrome, would be like a knife to the back or a bullet to the back because that would knock out half of your spinal cord in a nice clean way. Uh, that's not necessarily how things happen in real life, um, but you know, for the USMLE, you might expect that. So uh, a lot of times these patients will have penetrating trauma, gunshot wound, knife. Um, other patients that are uh, predisposed are patients with MS. They can get lesions in these specific areas or patients who have risk factors uh, for stroke because they can get infarction. The symptoms, of course, are the classic presentation. You get on one side your motor loss and spastic hemiplegia, as well as fine touch and vibratory sensation, and then on the other side, the side that's already decussated and is sensory, opposite-sided pain and temperature loss. The way to think of brown saquard syndrome is there is one tract that is unique in that it decussates right away and that is the, uh, the corticospinal tract. So the corticospinal tract is the one that's contralateral, and the other ones are ipsilateral. Diagnosis is going to depend, to depend on what your, uh, I, would, I, I suppose it would depend on uh, what you believe the cause is, because brown saquard syndrome is not a definitive diagnosis. It's a constellation of symptoms that tell you that there is a specific spinal injury. So depending on what you think the underlying cause is, that's going to be uh, your best initial step. So diag diagnosing should be focused on what you think the underlying cause is. However, uh, MRI would be the best initial diagnostic step if you're not sure. And that's assuming that trauma has been ruled out because you don't want to do an MRI in any patient that might have some kind of metal in their, uh, in their back. So CT, possibly, MRI would be the most accurate. It's really just going to be based on what you think the underlying cause is. Most of the time, questions on the USMLE that are uh, about this are going to give you uh, a patient and they're going to say, on one side, the patient has motor loss or weakness or paralysis and loss of fine touch and vibratory sensation. And then on the other side, they have pain and temperature loss um, from one point below. And they're going to ask what the diagnosis is. So this is uh, something from the ASIA um, that they put out for physicians to assess uh, motor loss, light touch, and pinprick, and uh, it gives you all your dermatomes. Um, so a lot of uh, ER docs, trauma surgeons, and uh, neurologists use this to uh, sort of organize their findings. The treatment for brown saquard syndrome is going to be focused on the underlying cause. So for non-penetrating spinal injuries, a lot of times steroids are used because it reduces uh, swelling following an injury. And there is some uh, controversy on the use of pre prednisone and other steroids. Uh, so for the USMLE, this is not really a definitive therapy. Um, there are some physicians now who are coming out and saying that they don't think it's useful, that the risks outweigh the benefits. For a long time, this was the, uh, the mainstay of therapy in spinal injuries, but now that's kind of coming into question. So um, if, if, if they do ask you for treatment um, and you get a list of drugs, uh, assuming that there's no underlying cause other than uh, trauma or um, any other kind of spinal injury, then uh, prednisone, methylprednisolone would be the best. Now, if the injury is a penetrating injury, then that, of course, is going to require surgical management. And so that would be um, deferred off to the surgeon.
And that's all I've got.